Okay, we're going to start our second lecture now on the background uh, of the prophecies that are behind Revelations 1, verse 1, of the things that are yet to happen. And hopefully that will help us demystify Revelation. So going back to what we started at the last time, and that is what is so key and so fundamental is knowing and understanding what the Old Testament has to say about end times. And Jesus Christ himself said in Matthew 5, 17 and 18, on the Sermon of the Mount, do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. This is so important. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, until heaven and earth disappear, until the end of times, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of the pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything, everything is accomplished. And now is he saying until everything is accomplished, but what he is saying here is that I will accomplish them. So, um, Without understanding Old Testament, there's no chance of understanding Revelation. If we did not have Revelation, what we already have in the Old Testament and in the, in the other New Testament writings would still give us the complete story on what to expect for the end of times and the day of the Lord. So this is very fundamental and very crucial. Now, having said that, uh, we had already talked a little bit about uh, the things which must soon take place uh, in Revelation, and that that centers on Israel, on Jerusalem, on Mount Zion, um, on the temple, on the Jewish people, uh, and the Middle East. This is the epicenter of Revelation. And what we're also going to discuss a little more in the background is the fulfillment of God's covenants to his people. This is crucial and fundamental into understanding what Revelation is all about. Um, and we will ex understand a little more about what Paul says, that all Israel will be saved. What does that mean? We will definitely be going through that in the weeks to come. Other events to, yet to come is Satan being unrestrained, similar to Job and, and what God uh, allowed Satan to get away with in Job, we're going to see something very similar and very much of a parallel in Revelation. In fact, if you've never read Job from beginning to end, I would highly recommend it because it would just help you understand there's a lot of parallels in what happens to Job and in Revelation. But anyway, with Satan being unrestrained, there'll be the enabling of the Antichrist, the false prophet, and there'll be the Great Tribulation. And the Great Tribulation is Satan pouring out his wrath against God's people, against Israel, against the Hebrews, against the church. Um, one of the things that will soon take place is the church's role in all this. The church is going to have an amazing evangelistic role. I, I would not be surprised if the church brings in a billion people to God's kingdom. Then we're going to talk a little bit about, especially today, the day of the Lord, Jesus' second coming, God's wrath, his judgments, his rewards. Last time we talked a lot about the marriage of the Lamb and what had happened in Exodus and what will happen in Revelation. We also talked about what the gospel is. The gospel is God's kingdom, the coming kingdom of God. And the restoration and establishment of God's kingdom is the gospel message. And so we went back to Genesis chapter one. We looked a little bit at what uh, God's kingdom was that was first established. We also talked a little bit about the seed of the, uh, of the woman. Uh, the seed of the woman that's, gonna, that's going to crush the head of Satan. That's going to crush the serpent. And of course, it also talked about the serpent will be able to strike his heel, that being what happened on the cross. But the seed of the woman, then we looked at that prophecy, how that was weaved through the Old Testament. We found out that the seed of the woman is going to come through the line of Abraham. It's going to come from the tribe of Judah. 
Uh, it's going to come from the line of King David. In fact, the seed of the woman is the anointed one, the Messiah. And then there was a lot more that started to unfold, and we're going to unfold a lot more this time as well. So without further ado, let's talk about another main line of prophecy. And what this is, is Yahweh. Yahweh the Lord, who is the cloud writer. And we're going to start off with Yahweh came and Yahweh will return. And all this starts very early in scripture in Deuteronomy 33. Deuteronomy 33 is Moses' blessing on the children of Israel. Very similar to what happened with Jacob in, in Genesis 49, where Jacob blessed his 12 sons. Well, guess what? In Deuteronomy 33, this is Moses' last speech to the children of Israel before they cross over the Jordan River into the promised land. And here he not only gives his blessings, but also prophecy of what yet to come in the history of uh, Israel. So, Deuteronomy 33, verse two. The Lord, Yahweh, Yahweh came with myriads of holy ones at your feet. They all bow down and from you receive instruction. The law that Moses gave us, the possession of the assembly of Jacob, he was king over Jeshurun, which is a pet name for Israel, when the leaders of the people assembled along with the tribes of Israel. Now there is an amazing prophecy in all this that is really not evident in English. Because in English, this is all talking about after the fact. The Lord came. Okay, he came with myriads of holy ones. I don't recall seeing that recorded in Exodus. So let's unpack this. The Lord Yahweh came. First of all, came, the verb came, is written in perfect tense. And before we get into perfect tense, let's just say this. That is, all scripture is inspired. It's the inspired word of God. All scripture is written and placed with intentionality and purpose. There's nothing arbitrary about, arbitrary about the, the, the scripture that's in there, nor its sentence structure in the original language. And as we found out in Revelations 1.1, Revelation, Jesus Christ is of or from, uh, and then we realize that in the original language, it's both. Well, something very similar in Hebrew comes here. The word came is perfect tense, and it can be translated as past. So the Lord came, it can be translated as present. The Lord is coming, and it can be translated as future. The Lord will come from Sinai. He came, or he's coming, or he will come with myriads of holy ones. And keep in mind, this myriads of holy ones has not happened yet. So the question is, what is it? The Lord came, the Lord is coming, the Lord will come. I think you know my take on that. The answer is yes, because that's what the original Hebrew says. It's up to the reader to put it in, to interpret and to put it in the context of what that version of to come means. So we talked a little bit about uh, with myriads of holy ones. This has not happened yet. Well, when will it happen? Let's look at some of the, the scripture in the Bible. And, it's, and once again, here's a little more of the revelation that we're talking about that's occurring uh, from the book of Revelation. Matthew 25, 31, Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory. Now, who's the Son of Man? That's Jesus Christ. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and 
all the angels with him. Hmm, that sounds to me like myriads of holy ones. He will sit on his glorious throne. Very, very powerful statement. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7, this will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. So the Lord Jesus being revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels, that sounds to me like he is coming with myriads of holy ones. In Jude 14 and 15, see the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones. Once again, sounds to me like myriads of holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all of them from the ungodly acts they have committed in their ungodliness and of all the defiant words ungodly sinners have spoken against him, against Jesus. And all this comes to a uh, end and a fulfillment in Revelations 19. Here's where it all comes to pass. I saw heaven open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. He is dressed in a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. Now, who do we know that their name is the Word of God? The Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus Christ. The armies of heaven were following him. That's definitely myriads of holy ones, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. So, the Lord came, yes, the Lord is coming, most definitely. The Lord will come, absolutely. From Sinai, we will flesh that out later down the road. Um, he came, he is coming, he will come with myriads of holy ones. That is yet to be fulfilled. But the interesting thing here is, Deuteronomy 33, Yahweh is coming. New Testament is Yeshua is coming with myriads of holy ones. So who is it? Is it Yahweh? Is it Yeshua? Is it both? And you know my answer. Yes, it is. And we're going to see more and more as we start looking at these Old Testament prophecies and as they start to come to pass and as they start to get further refined by prophets, there's going to be almost like a blending of, well, this is Yahweh, right? No, this is Yeshua. This is the Messiah. No, wait a minute. Maybe it's both of them. Or maybe it's just one. More to come on that. Deuteronomy 33 continues, at your feet they all bow down and from you receive instruction. The law Moses gave us, the possession of the assembly of Jacob. He was king over Jeshron, Israel, when the leaders of the people assembled along with the tribes of Israel. And there is so much here to flesh out, but we will say that for its appropriate place. More to come. Moses continues in verse 26. There is no one like the God of Jeshurun who rides across the heavens to help you and on the clouds in his majesty. The eternal God is your refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. He will drive out your enemies before you saying, destroy them. So Israel will live in safety. Jacob will dwell secure in a land of grain and new wine 
where the heavens drop to. Blessed are you, Israel, who is like you, a people saved by Yahweh. He is your shield and helper and your glorious sword. Your enemies will cower before you and you will tread on their heights. So this is really establishing a prophecy that Yahweh is going to return. Yahweh is going to come riding the clouds to save Israel. Now this is further explained later on in Psalm 68. And so let's look there. Where it talks about the Lord will ride the clouds to rescue his people. Yeah, we already know that. May God arise. May his enemies be scattered. May his foes flee before him. May you blow them away like smoke as wax melts before the fire. May the wicked perish before God. Now, I just want to point out, has this happened yet? No, this has not happened yet. But may the righteous be glad and rejoice before God. May they be happy and joyful. Sing to God, sing in praise of his name. Extol him who rides on the clouds. Rejoice before him. His name is Yahweh. So this is very important. This just reinforces that the perfect tense of the Lord came is also the Lord is coming and the Lord will come. And we read later on uh, in Psalm 68, scripture expands on what to expect. Surely God, now who's God here? will crush the heads of his enemies. Wait a minute, crush the heads of his enemies, crush the head of Satan. That's the seed of the woman. But wait a minute, the seed of the woman, we've already traced it through various lines and have found out that the seed of the woman is also what? The anointed one. Hmm. What is God trying to tell us? Surely God, the seed of the woman, will crush the heads of his enemies the hairy crowns of those who go on in their sins. The Lord says, I will bring them from Bashan. I will bring them from the depths of the sea that your feet may wade in the blood of your foes while the tongues of your dogs have their share. And we will read a lot more about this in Ezekiel 38 and 39 and Revelations 19. Um, more to come of this important prophecy of Yahweh, the cloud rider. And then we start to see these prophecies start converging. And in Daniel 7, we start reading that, wait a minute, the seed of the woman, the Messiah, Yahweh, the cloud rider, and the cloud rider, hmm, are they the one and the same? Because now we're looking at the Son of Man. In Daniel 7, verse 13, in my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a Son of Man. Okay, Son of Man. But wait a minute. Coming with the clouds of heaven. That's Yahweh, right? He approached the Ancient of Days. No, that's Yahweh. And he was led into his presence. He, who's he? The son of man, the Messiah, <clears throat> was given authority. Okay, fair enough. But he's also given glory and sovereign power. All nations and people of every language worship him. Who's him? The Messiah. Well, that legitimately cannot happen unless he's God, God Almighty. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. Well, that speaks of God that will not pass away and his kingdom is one that will never, never be destroyed. Wow, what are we saying here? Now let's compare Daniel 7, 13 and 14 to what Jesus Christ himself said. And the first passage is, is uh, Matthew 24, 30. This is the Olivet Discourse. This is where 
Jesus spent a long, quiet time personally with his disciples, explaining to them the end of days and what the sign of his coming will be, which we have not yet discussed. So the sign is yet to be discussed. Matthew 24, 30. Then there will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Well, that's right out of Daniel 7, 13, especially the Son of Man. And then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. Oh, the Son of Man is the cloud rider with power and great glory. So this is Daniel 7, 13 and 14, just being retold in Jesus' words. Matthew 26, 64, this is a very, very important verse where Jesus says, you have said so, Jesus replied, but I say to all of you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven. Wow, what is that? What's the context of all this? Well, that's explained in the verse right in front. So Matthew 26, 64, let's look at the verse in front. And I'm gonna have it below 64 here, but the verse in front, this is, Jesus before the at, in front of the high priest, his trial before the Sanhedrin uh, on whether or not to crucify Yeshua. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God Tell us if you're the Messiah, the Son of God. And we know Jesus' answer. You have said so. But I've said to all of you from now on, you will see the Son of Man. And everybody knew exactly who Jesus Christ was referring to as the Son of Man, sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Yeshua is the cloud rider. And we know what all happened there. They crucified him. Okay, so we have the Son of Man, the Messiah, this, this almighty Messiah uh, that's going to rule and reign forever. But Daniel goes on with a statement that just changes everything. Then after 60, the 62 weeks, the Messiah, the anointed one, will be cut off. NIV says, put to death. Huh? And have nothing. Huh? And the people of the prince who is to come, they will destroy the city, that being Jerusalem, and the sanctuary, that being the temple. Wait a minute, stop everything. We're saying the almighty Messiah is going to be put to death. Well, yep. In fact, that was even foretold 200 years in front of this prophecy by the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 53, 3. But he, who is he? He is the Messiah, was pierced for our transgressions. And here, once again, the English does not do us any favors. Go to the original Hebrew. The Hebrew is halal. And it means to pierce, to wound, or to kill. Now put it in context. But he was wounded. He was killed for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. So in one sense, the fact that the Messiah is going to be cut off, he's going to be put to death and have nothing, that should not have been a surprise because that had already been foretold 
by the prophet Isaiah. Okay, what are we saying here? Okay, let's take Daniel 9.25 and let's drop it into context in Daniel chapter 9. So, the verse in front. And this is after Daniel had uh, prayed his uh, prayer of repentance for the people of Israel. And the angel Gabriel came down and basically said, you're highly esteemed, Daniel. And because of this, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen in the future. And he says in Daniel 9, 24, he gives this unbelievable opening statement. Seventy sevens are decreed for your people and for your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. What has been said in this one verse is monumental. I mean, this is so heavy. So let's break it down. I, I did some rewriting of, actually, I didn't rewrite it. I just reorganized the words. They're still in the same order. But I put it in like a bullet form to help us grasp and capture what's being said here. Daniel 9, 24, 77 are decreed for your people, Daniel. Who's that? That's the Jews. And your holy city, Daniel. And what city is that? Obviously, Jerusalem. And then listen, this is what is decreed to finish transgression. Whoa. What is transgression? Transgression is man's rebellion and revolt against God. To put an end to sin. He didn't say atone for sin. He said to put an end to sin. That means the sinful nature that's within us, it's going to be taken away. Permanently, it will be put to an end. That means the, those that are out there that are evil people, uh, evil governments, uh, evil kings, uh, those that seek injustice, so those that are calling evil good and good evil, um, guess what? It's all going to be put to end. There's going to be an end to sin. That means no more wickedness because the next bullet, I'm going to atone for wickedness. So it's been decreed that wickedness will be atoned for. And we know that is fulfilled with the Messiah being cut off. To bring in everlasting righteousness. So, not only are we going to put an end to sin, we're going to atone for wickedness, but we're going to bring in everlasting righteousness. Not for a season, everlasting. This is the gospel. The gospel of the coming kingdom of God. To seal up vision and prophecy. So in other words, when this is all done, that's it. Everything will be fulfilled. Everything in the law and the prophets will be fulfilled. Everything that we are studying in the book of Revelation will be fulfilled. And last but not least, to anoint the most holy place, that being the temple of God himself. Is This is just an amazing, amazing prophecy. It is so hard to take this all in and digest and fully comprehend what's being said here. So anyway, let's take Daniel 9, 24 now and drop it in to the rest of the passage. So starting the next verse, 25. 
No one understand this. From the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be 70 sevens and 62 sevens. It will be rebuilt, it being Jerusalem, with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. After the 62 sevens, the anointed one, which we've already talked about, the Messiah, he will be put to death and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come after this will destroy the city and the sanctuary, the temple. The end will come like a flood. Now it's almost like we're shifting gears here. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end and desolations, plural, have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. Okay, who's this he we're talking about? Well, this person in the middle of the seven is going to put an end to sacrifice and offering and at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. Okay? Crystal clear, right? Ready to move on, right? I think we need to unpack this. So, let's do just that. No one understand this. Verse 25, from the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Well, the word went out under King Artaxerxes, his decree that happened on March 5th, 444 BC, as recorded in Nehemiah 2, verses 1 through 8, and 17 to 18. So that's the time that sets the stake in the ground where everything now is, is um, fulfilled in reference to this time. So from March 5th, 444 BC until the anointed one, the ruler, that being the Messiah comes, there's going to be 70, correction, there's going to be seven sevens, 49 years, and 62 sevens, which is 433 years. So you take seven sevens and 62 sevens, that's going to equal 483 years. And these are years built around lunar months. So there's uh, sabbatical years, which will take us to March 30th, 33 AD. Wow, okay. So March 30, 33 AD, then Jerusalem is going to be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble, well, I think we can safely say that when Jerusalem, uh, during the time of Jesus Christ, it was definitely times of trouble. And after the 62 sevens, so after March of uh, 33 AD, thereabouts, and we've got to keep in mind, there's a little bit of wiggle room here because uh, there is not a complete agreement on when B.C. ended and A.D. began. There's like two or three year leeway. But in, anyway, from that time on, the anointed one will be put to death and will have nothing. The date that most theologians have agreed upon that have really studied this believe that Jesus Christ was crucified on Passover, April 3rd, 33 AD. The people, the ruler who will come, that would be the Romans under Titus, they will destroy the city and the sanctuary, which we know happened in 70 AD. The end will come like a flood. Okay, now we're talking about the end. A little different subject. War will continue until the end, and desolations have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with many. Now, who's he? Uh, he's the one that in the middle of seven is going to put an end to sacrifice and offering. So he is the Antichrist. The Antichrist is going to confirm a covenant with many. Okay, remember, Revelation revolves around what? Israel, the Hebrew people, Jerusalem, Mount Zion, uh, the, the Middle East theater. So to confirm a covenant with many, most likely that could be like an international treaty, maybe set up through the United Nations, who knows, uh, but it'll be brokered by the Antichrist. 
or let's just call it a Middle East peace accord. Uh, but in any case, the Antichrist is going to confirm a covenant with many for one seven, for seven years. And in the middle of the seven, that means three and a half years into it, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. To put an end to sacrifice and offering means there has to be sacrifice and offerings reinstituted. And how can that happen? The very next sentence. And at the temple. So there's going to be a third temple that will be built in Jerusalem. He will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out. And that pouring out will be God's wrath. The seven bowls in Revelation. So you have the seven seals, you have the seven trumpets, and then you got the seven bowls where God's wrath is literally poured out on Satan, on the Antichrist, on his kingdom. Now, there are some theologians that go, wait a minute, Antiochus Epiphanes in the second century BC, he set up an abomination of desolation, right? In the temple, and, you know, sacrifice a pig, and you had the Maccabean uh, revolt, and uh, that was all the cleansing of the temple. Yeah, that did happen, but guess what? What happened after that? Not the end. So Antiochus Epiphanes is not the fulfillment. Now, many times in prophecies, there's a near-term fulfillment and a far-term fulfillment, which is a, the actual fulfillment. And so, yeah, we have to acknowledge that. Uh, but this is yet to come. And notice uh, the Antichrist, which was uh, introduced in the chapter before in Daniel 8, and Daniel 11, starting in verse 36 to the end of Daniel, gives a detailed description of the Antichrist in the last three and a half years is going to lead up to the end of age. I mean, Daniel is just so important to understanding Revelation. I just wish we had the time to go through the whole book of Daniel, but we don't. But we will take bits and pieces here and there to help put together the pieces of the puzzle of what the end of times is and how all of this is related and interpreted in Revelation. So anyway, moving along. Daniel 77s. Well, okay. You got a convincing argument there, but how relevant really? I mean, seriously, how relevant is Daniel? How relevant is the 77s? I mean, seriously. Well, okay. If we won't go seriously, who's the most important person to endorse this? That would be the Messiah himself, Jesus Christ, right? So in Jesus' teaching about end times and the second coming, which is the Olivet Discourse, to, that he privately sat down with his disciples and explained, Jesus referred to Daniel as key, as fundamental to understanding what will happen during the end times. So let's go to that first, Matthew 24, 15 and 16, where Jesus says, so when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. And he goes on. So what's he saying here? He's saying, if you want to understand the end times, I'm not going to go back and explain it all to you. It's already there. It's there in Daniel. Go read Daniel. Daniel explains. And if you read Daniel, then guess what? You, the reader, you will understand. Remember what started this whole discussion was what Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount. Do not think that come to abolish the law or the prophets. Daniel is definitely a major prophet here. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And let me just say this. Each and every one of these prophets, they speak at length of end times and what's going to happen. We're just picking on some of the heavy hitters here. 
Jesus says, for truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, until the end of times, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished by me, Jesus Christ. So just, I, it's worth reiterating just how important Daniel is, just how important the law is, like the blessings of Moses, just how important the prophets are. So what can we conclude from Daniel 77s? First of all, Daniel 77s, there's some really detailed math and timeline given so that there's no room for misinterpretation. And what does that tell us? That tells us that the Messiah had to arrive, according to Daniel 77s, and be sacrificed after the 32-33 AD mark, but before the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Now, we also have gone through some earlier prophecies that already established the Messiah had to come from the line of Judah, had to come from the line of King David. He also had to come from the seed of the woman. Uh, also, we realize that from Isaiah, uh, a couple of hundred years before the time of Daniel, uh, where he prophesied that the virgin will give birth to Emmanuel. The Immaculate Conception Okay, so with all this criteria, who came around 32, 33 AD and was put to death, who claimed to be the Messiah, uh, and also you know, came to death before the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. And also this person just happened to come from the line of Abraham, of Judah, of David, uh, also, this person is the result of the virgin birth of Mary, uh, where it's, it's documented um, in the New Testament. Can we think of anybody that meets this criteria? Only one. Only one. And he was given the name Yeshua. He is the only one. I mean, Daniel 77s, if, if you want to do, give a convincing argument, especially to a Jewish believer, that Jesus Christ is, no kidding, the Messiah, step them through Daniel 77s. It has converted a lot of Jews into Messianic Jews. Now, it's also obvious in the prophecies that we've already been discussing and looking at that Jesus when he came, he did not fulfill all these Messianic prophecies. There's more to come, obviously. But one thing that we need to keep in mind, and that is prophecy never foretold that this was all gonna happen in one single span of time. The prophets never said that. Which means there's only two conclusions. There either had to be two messiahs, one that will come later, which is not the case, or there is one Messiah, one Son of Man, one Son of God, and he is coming two separate times with two separate missions. And there's going to be a gap of time between his coming and his second coming. Now, Jesus Christ, when he started his ministry, he gave very strong hints that this was going to be the case in Luke 4, 16 through 21, because with his incomplete reading of Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2, where he stopped him in sentence, saying, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So let's go there. Luke 4, 16 through 21. <clears throat> he, being Jesus, went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Now, I need to, we need to take a time out and just explain what's going on here. Because on these Sabbaths, these synagogue readings, these are not arbitrary readings. These are readings that have already been established 
decades, centuries before by rabbis that basically said, okay, on this Sabbath, on this year, in this month, uh, this is what's going to be read. And there was two, uh, there was there was two categories: the Pasha, which is the Mosaic Law, the first five chapters, the Pentateuch, and then there's what's called the Haftarah. The Haftarah is the prophets. And so, when Jesus came on that Sabbath, he was handed the scroll of the prophet Isaiah for the assigned reading. Let's read on. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me. I am the anointed one. To proclaim good news to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolled up the scroll, mid-sentence. He stopped, did not complete the reading. He gave it back to the attendant. He sat down and the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. They knew what was going on it was not a normal reading. And he began by saying to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Wow. So let's go to Isaiah 61, verse two verses. We're not gonna read it all, but at least give uh, an idea of what was not read versus what was read. The spirit of the sovereign Yahweh is on me because Yahweh has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. What's that good news we know? The kingdom of God. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of, law, of Yahweh's favor. And then he stops. What did he not read? and the day of vengeance of our God to cover, comfort all who mourn. And then he goes on and explains uh, the day of the Lord, what's going to happen. It's an amazing, amazing event that happens. And just as Jesus telling us that there's going to be two missions the Lord came, the Lord is coming, the Lord will come. Okay, let's continue on. Additionally, there was to be a 2,000 year gap, or at least it's, that's what we think it's gonna be, 2,000 years. The church age between the, 69, the 69th sevens and the final seven. Now, why the gap? What's the purpose of this? And this is the best news of all for the sake of you and me, for the sake of the Gentiles. Promised in the Abrahamic covenant. So many people think the Abrahamic covenant is just about Abraham and his descendants and the blessing is being on them, but we'll read it and we'll see. We'll draw our own conclusion. Anyway, this allowed the full number of Gentiles to come in. So let's explore that. First of all, the Abrahamic covenant, where Yahweh tells Abraham, 
where he says, and through your offspring, Abraham, through your offspring, that being through the Jewish people, all nations on earth will be blessed. I say this again, all nations, not just Israel, all nations on earth, the whole earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Jesus explains a little more of this in Luke 21, where he says, they, the Jews in Israel, will fall by the sword and they will be taken as prisoners. Now we're talking about the, the end times um, by the Antichrist to all the nations and Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Rome, uh, uh, Paul in Romans 11 explains this even further. He says, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles have come in. And in this way, and we've heard this mentioned more than once now, all Israel will be saved. And there's a lot more to be explained on that down the road. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. That be Jesus Christ. And he will turn godlessness away from Jacob, away from Israel. Ephesians 3, 6, this mystery. What's this mystery? The mystery of uh, Jesus Christ, the mystery of the church, the mystery of the gospel. This mystery is that through the gospel, that being God's coming kingdom, the Gentiles, are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body and shares together in the promise in Messiah, the anointed one in Christ Jesus. Another interesting verse in Revelation 6, it's then each of them, each of them were, these were martyrs that had been killed um, under the, the great tribulation, was given a white robe and they were told to wait a while longer why? Until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters were killed just as they had been. So the full number of Gentiles coming in, it's part of the plan. This is the reason why Jesus said, salvation is from the Jews. That's what the Abrahamic covenant said very clearly in black and white. Galatians 3, 8 through 9, Scripture. Now, Scripture back then was what? The Old Testament, of course. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. That's the Abrahamic covenant, where he says all nations will be blessed through you, through you, the Jews. Salvation is from the Jews. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Just an amazing statement. Fusions though, Fusions chapter two. Wow, it just puts it all together in such an exciting way. Starting in verse 11 where it says, you who are Gentiles, that's me, that's you, most of you guys at least, by, by birth and called uncircumcised, Remember that at that time, you were separate from Messiah. You were separate from the anointed one. You were excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants, my covenants to my people of the promise. You were without hope. You were without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood 
of the anointed one, by the blood of Jesus Christ. For he himself, Jesus, is our peace, who has made the two groups, the Jews and the Gentiles, the, the nation of Israel and all the other nations of the earth, into one. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body, the body of Christ, to reconcile both of them to God through the cross. This is the gospel message. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners, you're no longer strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. Members, not servants, members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. Messiah, the anointed one, Yeshua, as the chief cornerstone. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles, the Gentiles, are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body and shares together in the promise of Christ Jesus. So let me say, shares together means the covenants that God established with the nation of Israel, guess what? That covenant is now being honored by God to both Jew and Gentile through the Lord Jesus Christ because we have been reconciled to God, a new humanity out of the two through the cross. This is just, this is the good news. Okay, in all this in the covenants talks and whatnot, there's one covenant that we really need to also just highlight, and that is a new covenant, a new covenant for Israel. Oh, wait a minute. A new covenant for Israel, that's also a new covenant for us, right? Through Christ? Yes. And this is all going to be fulfilled in Revelation. So let's go there. Ezekiel, Ezekiel 36, 22. Therefore say to the Israelites, okay, <laughs> that includes us. This is what the sovereign Lord, the sovereign Yahweh says. It is not for your sake, people of Israel, that I'm going to do these things, so don't let that go to your head, but for the sake of my holy name. Then the nations will know that I am the Yahweh, declares the sovereign Yahweh, when I am proved holy through you, through you before their eyes, for I will. I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water. Where have we heard that before? I will sprinkle clean water. We could call it living water on you, the mikveh. And you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. And then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors. You will be my people. 
you will be my treasured possession and I will be your God. This is so monumental, it's so amazing. God's, this is God's heart. He's a forgiving, loving God. Jeremiah 31 explains it further. He says, the days are coming. Okay, the days are coming. We'll read about that in Revelation. Declares Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel. And we know that includes now Jew and Gentile. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt because they, at Mount Sinai because they broke my covenant right in front of me, right under my nose, though I was a husband to them. I was a husband to them. That is just a huge statement coming from the God of all creation. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time declares Yahweh. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God. They will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, no Yahweh, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Let me just say that one more time. I, the Lord, will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. And thus all of Israel will be saved. We find out also that Jesus Christ himself, Yeshua, the anointed one, he's the one that will mediate the new covenant in Hebrews 9, 15. Now we're jumping into the New Testament. For this reason, Christ, the anointed one, is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called, and we will find out later, this is the elect, this is also the remnant, uh, may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Now that he, he being Yeshua, Jesus Christ, has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. So, we're going to stop there. This is as far as I want to take Revelation 1, verse 1, concerning the things which must soon take place that have already been firmly established in the Old Testament that the Jewish scholars already knew and we're expecting when we're talking about the Messiah or the end times. And this in itself is going to be very important as we go um, deeper into Revelation. So the things which must soon take place, um, we're beginning to see beyond a shadow of doubt this centers on Israel, on Jerusalem, on the Jewish people, on Mount Zion, that the countries involved, the theater is going to be the Middle East. This is the episode of Revelation. And we hopefully now understand a little more of what fulfillment of God's covenant to his people Israel is all about. A little more about what all Israel will be saved is about. Uh, we have yet to really get into too much other than the abomination of desolation, but of Satan being unrestrained, similar to what happened in the book of Job, enabling the Antichrist, the uh, false prophet, uh, allowing Satan to pour out his wrath on Israel, on the Hebrew people, on the Christians, which is called the Great Tribulation. We're going to read more about what the church's role is going to be in all this. Um, the day of the Lord and Jesus' second coming. We've already touched on a few of the Old Testament prophecies there of what to expect, um, especially Yahweh, the, the cloud rider, or is it Yeshua, the cloud rider, the son of man, the cloud rider. Anyway, the cloud rider. Yes, he's coming and he will come. And with that, Second coming, we will see God's wrath 
We will see his judgments. We'll see his rewards. In Revelations 19, which we discussed about in the first uh, week, the marriage of the Lamb, it will finally come to pass, not because of what we've done, but because of what he has done in the new covenant. And all this will result, result in the restoration and establishment of God's kingdom, a new heaven and a new earth, which we will read about in the end of Revelation. So I'm going to stop there. And the next time we will pick up with Revelations chapter 1, verse 2. And let me just say, I am really, really, really looking forward to this discussion because this is really going to hit home the revelation of Jesus Christ. Revelation Jesus Christ and a little bit on the Holy Spirit as well. Um, this is, could possibly be one of the more important lectures coming up. And I just feel it's just that important. So more to come. And with that, be blessed.